Thank you, Robert. Good morning to everybody. It is great to have all of our visitors with us today and all of our regular members here at Sunny Slope. How blessed we are to be together. What a beautiful day outside, and, and even if it was storming outside, it would be beautiful in here, a beautiful day, because we're all together to worship God. I want to thank uh, those who uh, came in from out of the area to preach in my place over the last couple of Sundays as my wife and I were away, and uh, most, most people realized we went uh, on a trip that we had been planning and saving for for a number of years that COVID killed for three years in a row, finally got there to Hawaii. And we, uh, I love nature and love to see God's beauty and his handiwork, and so we got a new experience in exer- observing that that we had not seen before in anywhere in all of our travels. It was great, and it was a cruise we took from island to island, and so God blessed us with that ability. It's interesting, though, going this time of the year, everybody was at least Scott's age, you know, so uh, there weren't there very many younger folks there. I'm just joking, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it was really wonderful. It was wonderful to be back and appreciate those who took my place while I was gone. I want us to think about something today and next Sunday. Um, before I left a couple of weeks ago, I guess it's been three weeks ago now, uh, as far as Sundays are concerned, I, was, I did a series of, about the reality of the devil, and I'm trying to help us to understand the devil's real, and we need to always be on guard against him. So I talked about, you know, don't let the devil win. We looked at that particular concept and principle in a couple of different sermons, then I followed that up with, you can beat the devil. So I kind of looked at it from the negative perspective, don't let the devil win, be on guard, but then I also tried to look at it from the positive perspective, you can beat the devil. You don't have to, to, to worry about you, him overcoming you against your will, you can beat the devil. Well, I want us to now focus on a couple of lessons talking about loving God. You see, there's, there's two, there's, there, there are two beings or two forces in life, and one's God and one's the devil. And what I've tried to get across in teaching and preaching, and I think maybe I've even honed it down a little bit more just recently, is if God does not exist, and there are a whole lot of people out there now telling us they don't believe in God, they don't believe God exists, I'm afraid that in our major universities that it's very prevalent now that we've got uh, in, in, an administration or at least the, the professors and the teachers and everything who are by and large skeptics or agnostics or outright atheists. And so they're, they're teaching our young college students things that, that contradict what the scriptures teach about God and about righteousness. They're trying to be more relevant in their mind and more sophisticated and more intellectual in their mind. You can't get more intellectual than God. You can't get more sophisticated than God. God is the creator. When you take God out of the picture, then you are at a loss. You're, you're, how, how do you determine right from wrong? How do you determine good from evil? Now, someone might say, well, there's goodness out there. You don't have to believe in God. Explain it to me. Because without God, there is no basic standard for goodness. It's all relative. It's up to whatever I think, whatever I feel. And I can change my mind at the drop of a hat as to what I consider to be good and consider to be evil. But understand this also. If there is no God, not only is there no basic standard for for goodness, But if there is no God, there also is no evil. Have you thought about that? You see, without a basic standard for goodness, which is God, then you cannot determine evil. There is no evil. And yet we see evil all around us. My wife and I were talking about it just last evening. Evil is there. We recognize that. Because there's evil, there is goodness. Without evil... There is no goodness. You see, the two are opposites, and one understands the other one. And for there to be a basic standard and recognition of evil, we also have to have a basic understanding of goodness and the author of that, and that is God. A lot of people 
They want to change their lives. They want to get better in their lives. They want to reach for something more than what they have been experiencing and what they've been achieving in their lives and what their thinking has been, the direction of their lives and all of that. The word repent means technically a change of mind. But inherent within that understanding of a change of mind is a change of behavior, a change of mind that leads to a change of behavior. Well, so from one perspective, a whole lot of, or, or another, a whole lot of people, they want to do better in their lives. They want to change their lives for the better. Now, for some of those, they want to change because they face some tremendous problems in their lives, such as financial problems, and they suffer some, from serious health problems in some cases of various kinds, or maybe others are dealing with legal problems. Some are in jail. I've had a lot of experience, you know, communicating with, with people who are in jail and helping them, and not just myself, but through correspondence, course ministries of, of the congregation here and another congregation I worked with many years ago, helping a lot of people come to a better understanding of what the direction of their life needs to be and actually helping them become Christians. And I'm thankful for the work that we're doing here at Sunny Slope along that line and in that direction. But there are more people than most, peop most of us realize who are caught up in the drug culture or in alcoholism. And so they want to do better, but they're in addiction and they have a difficult time figuring out how can I get out of this? I want to do better. I want to be better, but they have to get help to do that. Where do they go for the help? Then there are some other people who want to change their lives for the better and, and see their problem that they deal with is they're elderly. And it's not just a chronological age kind of thing, they're experiencing some effects of being elderly. Their bodies are, are wearing out, even in some cases breaking down. And so they, they're, they're experiencing pain and being tired and being less mobile. And there's where family and friends need to step in and be there with them and for them and help them along those lines. But outwardly, we see a lot of people, and we would look at them from, from our outward perspective and say, you know, they're doing great. Things are really going well for them. Look at how much money they've got. Look at the great job. Look at the big house they've got. But privately, they're unhappy. They're experiencing problems in their lives as well. They're experiencing serious relational problems in some cases. Now, some look for happiness and fulfillment in mainly through materialism, things that they could buy, things that they could own and have, and sometimes through worldly pleasures, illicit sexual relationships, and the time-consuming career that they have been successful at, in some cases extremely successful. But again, they have come up empty in their lives, and they want to do better. But a lot of times they don't know where to turn. In all of these cases, a lot of times people are, are experiencing anger on an ongoing basis because of the situations they're facing in life. And they can't seem to let go of that anger. Well, where do they go? How do they, what, what, what do they do? Where do they turn? And here's the simple bottom line answer. And it's not going to be an automatic, overnight, complete change and, and, and all of a sudden achieve everything that you were, you were missing and fill all of the emptiness immediately, full, completely to the top. But it's the beginning and it's a profound change that will lead to what you're really needing. And that is begin by loving God. As trite as it might seem to some, loving God is the best way to begin to find true happiness and fulfillment and meaning in life. We look at Matthew chapter 22, as was read a few moments ago. When Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment in the law? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And he said, this is the first and great commandment. When you think about the extent to which Jesus gave that answer, 
And I believe in Luke, he adds one more as he recorded Jesus' response. And he said, with all your strength. So is Jesus saying, with, with everything you are, with all of your being, love God. And if we will have that focus in our life, then that is the beginning to turn our lives around. Remember what that word repent means again, technically, a change of mind. But it's a change of mind that leads to a change of lifestyle, a change of behavior, change of the way we live. How can I accomplish that? Well, we have all kinds of self-help manuals, all kinds of self-help seminars, and there are all kinds of... of, of uh, uh, therapy kinds of groups that, that, that can meet on a regular basis, but all of that can only go so far if we really want to find the true meaning and the true happiness that we need and that we're seeking in life, we've got to start loving God. And I'm not talking about a superficial, surface level, you know, touchy-feely, just oozy, warm-feeling kind of love. I'm talking about a love that is profound, a love that, that translates into a lifestyle. I want to be with God for all of eternity. I want to walk with God right now. I want, I want God to be with me. I want to be holding his hand and him holding my hand all the time. I want to guide my life and direct my life by his love for me. And I love him because he first loved me. When we look at the first four of the original Ten Commandments, going back to Exodus chapter 20, those first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. Have you thought about that? And let's look at those just briefly for a few moments this morning. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, you shall love, or you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Well, God has to be the only God. He is the only God in reality. But we need to translate that into our mindset so that our lives are lived in such a way that we recognize and we live before him as God, number one in our lives. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, as Jesus was moving on through what we call the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He's just been talking about the necessities of life, food and clothing particularly. And then he comes to verse 33 toward the end of chapter 6 and he says, Love the, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We can boil that down and we can say, seek God first. Put him first in your life. And all these things, if you're walking with God, he'll be walking with you. And, and God will take care of you. Now, you may not have that big house. You may not have that most expensive car. You may not have all of the electronic gadgets that you see other people with. But God will be there with you, and he will bless you and take care of you. But it begins by loving God, by loving God. In verses 4 and 5, also, Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37 goes a little bit further. I apologize. And so here Jesus says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now, he's not saying don't love your father and mother. He's not saying don't love your son and daughter. Plenty of verses teach us about family love. But he says, I still have to come first. And the love that you should have for your mother and father, that you should exhibit toward your children that's going to be based upon my love for you and your love for me in response. You're going, to love about, you're going to learn about true love, the meaningful love, the sustaining love through my love for you. And in reciprocal fashion, your love then for me. You will be able to translate that into your life for others. Idols can come in various forms. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, the next step in that, those first four uh, uh, of the original Ten Commandments, Moses goes on, and of course he's writing God's word. And so God's speaking through what Moses is writing. And he says, you shall make for yourself no carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that 
which is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. You could look at some other passages of scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, that describe in, in rather intricate detail the absurdity of worshiping idols. In one particular text, it talks about how the worker goes out and cuts down a tree. And then, of course, he trims off the branches. And then he gets his tools and starts carving images in that tree. And then he puts the tree on a stand. Now, he has manufactured all of that himself. And then he bows down and worships it as a god. He made it himself. And then he worships it as a god. Now, that's absurd on the surface level. At the base of it, even. It's absurdity. But you know, we actually have people who call themselves Christians today who worship through idols. They have all kinds of statues and images all around them. Icons, they'll hang on the walls in their home and they'll bow down and pray through those. Now they'll say, well, they're not really worshiping those. You explain to me the difference between what the scriptures teach there, Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, and what they're doing. It contradicts the very basics of the original Ten Commandments. But now, it's not just the idea of physical images, because idols can take forms other than some carved or graven or, or manufactured image. It can be a job, it can become an idol to a lot of people, and I'm afraid it does become an idol. Or a career, we become so dedicated to that career that we push God aside. Or it might be a hobby even. Or some relationship. Or sex. Or drugs, or alcohol, or getting more and more money, or materialism, the things that money can buy. Or an undue emphasis, or seeking personal pleasure can become idols to a lot of people. That's what they think about most of the time in their waking hours. That's what they're pursuing. That's what they're focused on. And that's what they're really going after. And those things, and you could think of others as well, I'm sure, they can become effectively idols for us. And they will, because we're so focused on them, they will push God into the background or maybe even out of our lives altogether. And then we move to verse 7. And here, the text goes on. The, the first four of the original Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I pondered over that particular understanding of taking God's name in vain a great deal for many years. I'm afraid a lot of times we just flippantly use God's name over and over again without even thinking about it. Any kind of thing that happens in our life, anything, you know, uh, our favorite basketball player, he, he shoots a three-pointer and wins the game and people will blurt out, oh my God. Well, was that really a proper use of God's name? Or they'll just be using casual, you know, conversation and they'll lace it continually. I've heard people over and over and over again, oh my God, oh my God. And then we've even got it abbreviated, right, and, and in social media now, OMG. I had to think about that first for a while. I'm not all that, you know, right into all those abbreviations in social media. I've got to figure them out. And then I figure, oh, that's what that means. I think that's, we need to be careful about how we use God's name. We need to revere God, including in our speech. And we need to never, ever use his name in any kind of profane way. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 12 you shall not swear by my name falsely, for you, uh, nor shall you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. 
And how many people in anger continually curse and use profanity with God's name right in the middle of it? That's breaking that particular commandment. That's, that's going in contrast. And it doesn't matter if you're, you're all of a sudden worked up emotionally. Somebody's made you angry. You need to be control, in control of how you speak. We need to revere God. We need to never, ever use his name in vain. And then we look at the fourth commandment. And I realize that this particular one is not kind of brought into the New Testament Christianity teachings. But the principle is what I want us to look at. Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. He's talking about a day of remembering God in worshipfulness. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath day of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now I remember... I realize we worship by New Testament Christian teachings on the first day of the week. But the principle is what I'm trying to get across there. God is saying, remember me in worship. Remember, make time to worship me. And we need to be dedicated to God in that very focused way. It's great to see everybody here this morning worshiping God but there are a whole lot of more people out there who are doing all kinds of other things or nothing at all. Why are they not worshiping God? We look a little bit further, New Testament Christianity. Acts 20 and verse 7. On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, that is to partake of the Lord's Supper, Paul, ready to depart on on, on the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. They gathered on the first day of the week. Which first day of the week? The first day of the week. Every week has one. And they gathered together to worship God, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to remember the death and the burial and the resurrection, the sacrifice and the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God the Son. They did that on the first day. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but all the more exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We need to plan to worship God regularly with the Lord's church. Now we can find all kinds of excuses and in my my earlier life I, I was a master of excuses but they don't hold any water when it comes to the reality of really loving God as we should. We need to love God. And if we want that better life, if we want that more fulfilling life, if we want to really grasp that deepest meaning of what God has designed our human life on this earth to be with a soul, it begins by loving God. And part of loving God is we're going to worship him. Because he is our creator. He is the blessings giver. And so there's those first four of the original Ten Commandments. They all deal with our relationship with God. Now, true love for God. True love for God is naturally exhibited through our obedience to his teachings. Now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep his commandments, the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Now, did you get that last part? The commandments which I command you for your good. 
A lot of people look at the scriptures and they say, well, that's, a, just an old, that's just a rule book, a book full of rules. I don't want that. God gave us the teachings of scripture for our good. And if we will live by those teachings, the goodness that they will bring to our lives, that that lifestyle will, will bring to our personal lives, far surpass anything the teachings of this world will bring for us. For our good. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 3. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. A whole lot of folks, they want the blessings from God, they just don't want the commitment to God. They want to receive without giving. And I'm talking about giving their life to him. They want God to watch over them. They want salvation. They just don't want to have to live the life of the saved. Real fulfillment, the better life, the real joy in life, no matter what we might be facing, the peace that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7 that surpasses understanding, that is all begins when we turn to God in love. And if we turn to God in love fully, we're going to turn our lives over to God. We look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. You look at that 119th Psalm, the longest of all the Psalms. We've got over 140 verses of scripture as they've been broken down. You read that sometime. All but four or five of those verses, well over 140 verses, all but four or five of those refer to the teachings of God's word in one way or another. Is that amazing? See, they're there for us for a reason. For a reason. Our obedience to God will be evidence of our love for God. And to claim love for God without being obedient to him through his teachings. Well, the scripture tells us, going back to 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, is a lie. It's empty words. It's hollow. God's commandments and teachings, again, are there for our good. The devil's working to try to lead us into unhappiness ultimately for all of eternity. In fact, he's leading us into a, a reality that's going to bring us incredible agony. But God's word is there to guide us in eternal bliss. Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 24, the Lord commanded us, observe all these statutes to fear the Lord our God for our good always that he might preserve us alive as it is this day this will be the righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us sometimes we may not understand exactly why God says I want you to do this or I want you to stay away from that but in those times, we need to simply understand God knows better than I do. And we simply follow those teachings, and later on, we probably come to a point where we say, I understand now why he said this, why he said that. If we simply will submit to his will for our lives. Living by his commandments is the bottom line of faithfulness and righteousness. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter, the wise man wrote. For God, fear God. And we're not talking about being afraid of God, shaking in our boots. We're talking about a reverence. We're talking about holding him in awe in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. This is man's all. 
And when we put that into practice in our lives, that principle on a consistent basis, we find true happiness. True happiness. Even in the face of physical difficulties, we find an inner happiness that sustains us. We love God because he first loved us. He gave us the example to begin with. And love should begat love. 1 John 4 and verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. In verses Nine, uh, verse 19, I'm sorry, verses 9 and 10, we go back a few verses. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us in that, uh, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the substitute hanging on that cross for our sins. He paid the price for us because of Our need, we could not forgive ourselves. We could not do anything to bring about our own forgiveness because we were sinners. But God sent his son in love and Jesus went to that cross in love and paid the price for the guilt of our sins. That's how much God loves us. But it didn't stop there. He loves us so much that he's still still patient with us. Peter said in, 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 in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, God is not willing that any should perish but it's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's giving us time, but he is holding us accountable, and we need to recognize that. Think about the great verse of Scripture, perhaps the most quoted of all Scriptures throughout the entire Bible, John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus went to that cross because of God's love, out of God's love. And then, as Paul put it in Romans 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Have you thought about somebody in some relationship in your life and they're, they want you to do something for them and, and you say, okay, I'll... I might be willing to do that, but first you've got to do this or this or this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love by sending his son to the cross to die for us. No greater love has this, Jesus says. John 15, beginning with verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends And then he tells his apostles on that occasion, you are my friends, but conditionally, if you do whatever I command you. 1 John 4 and verse 9 again, in this the love of God was manifested, demonstrated, made apparent to us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. He offers us eternal life through his love, because of his love for us. He created us to love us. Now, we need to begin to tap into all of those blessings that he offers us by beginning to love God first. He loved us first, but now if we want all that he offers us, we need to love God. We begin by loving God. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, beginning with verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And then notice Galatians 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ, the apostle Paul writes. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And God's love for us ought to initiate Love on our part for him. And then we can begin to change our life by God's grace through his blessings and his guidance. So the question then, are you living obedient to God's teachings daily, consistently? 
That demonstrates your love. If you're not, you need to ask yourself, do I really love God? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14 and verse 15. If you're holding back and say, well, I, I, I want to still be in this kind of relationship over here, or I, I still want to take part in this, I still want to do that over there, and you know those are contradictory to God's teachings, then remember what John said. If you're not walking in the light, if you say you're in fellowship with him, but you're living in a way that demonstrates you're not, he says you're a liar. The truth is not in you. Do you really love God? Really love God? Are you ready to give your life to him? Remember, love without obedience is hollow, empty, shallow, and maybe even a lie. Show God your love for him by coming to him in obedience today. How do you do that? God, I want to change my life. I'm ready to repent. I'm ready to begin that change of mind that's going to lead me to a change of lifestyle. I'm going to turn away from sin. And with your help, your strength, your guidance, I will get better and better at that decision and at that commitment. And I'm going to surrender to my Lord and Savior in baptism, buried with him in the waters of baptism. That's what baptism is, a burial, so that the blood that he shed on the cross can be effective to cleanse me of the guilt of my sins. And I can be cleansed of all of that guilt. I can be reborn, John 3, verses 3 through 5. I can be made new from a spiritual perspective. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Are you ready to do that? Do you need to study some more about that? We'll help you if you'll ask us. Or maybe you're in a position where you said, you know, I have done all of that. I made that commitment one time. I love God so much, but I have strayed from that deep commitment of love. We'd love to pray for you about that and pray with you. All you have to do is step forward and let us know or talk with us privately. If you need to come, come right now as we stand together and sing.